My name is Kevin Simmons. Uh, my name is Kevin Simmons. Uh, this is the uh, first installment of our uh, Stories from the River uh, post training. And so um, we welcome everybody here. I'm hoping we can see there's something up with the way that my screen is being shared. Um, hope you don't mind seeing this full view. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Simmons, and this is the first installment of Stories from the River, uh, Motivational Interviewing and Tribal Populations. Uh, I'm joined here today, and, and we'll have an opportunity to hear from uh, one of our co-trainers, uh, uh, Kevin Tomlin. And I'm also joined here by A.J. Goins, who's a representative of ODHS and the federal policy, uh, also a, a, a member of the uh, training team and has been doing quite a bit of work um, since we all began and has been with us since the beginning. Um, for today here, um, one of the things that we really want to get to is is really kind of discuss the power of of connection um and how motivational interviewing can can help us do that not only you know within our offices within our our you know our community but specifically with the work that we're doing and the work that we're doing here in terms of grand run is in child welfare but we know that motivational interviewing has significance in in other areas particularly with our populations um so uh, as a quick review here um you know we'll have an opening um i'll kind of discuss a little bit of of this part of stories from the river and then we'll turn it over to to uh kevin uh tomlin well he'll kind of drive us through uh kind of some review of mi and then and deliver some content about power of connection um as a few housekeeping measures i you know if you do have comments or questions while we're talking you certainly can throw that into the chat one of us or all of us can attend to that um and then we have some time and and at the end squared away for discussion um, as we move on, we really would like folks to be uh, comfortable or trying to create a space where folks are comfortable, where we can share and interact a little bit. We know that and anticipate that this group will grow larger over the next months or so because of the implementation and because of the MI work we're doing here in the state of Oregon. So, but we this stories from the river is is really a, a component of an extension of the training that we all have been through together now. Um, stories from the river first started as um, as an opportunity to learn a little bit about motivational interviewing prior to going into training. Uh, we use this platform virtually to connect people, but also to use it to teach about motivational interviewing so that when we did when we do arrive in communities, um, people have an understanding, a basic understanding of, let's say, just the spirit of MI. Um, now, after the training, one of the pieces that we're really uh, wanting to do and build in is we want to create a community. Right? A lot of times within our our within Indian country and particularly here in the state of Oregon, uh, we get so we get so siloed in the work that we do. You know we. We get isolated to Grand Ron, to to Chiloquin, to to the state work. That this truly is, and we're hoping that this is a space where folks can can come together. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm reminded of is is just how fortunate I feel like and grateful that I am to. You know, we started this in my journey uh, almost a year and a half ago with Dr. Tomlin, myself, and, and AJ Goins. And we just started planning and talking about bringing this to the communities, really to serve the people in our communities. As an intention to really prevent children from being removed from their homes. And that's the genesis of what we were trying to do. And along the way, you know, we have met new people and people have joined the team. But one of the things that I truly have on my heart here uh, this afternoon is like, I just, I feel so grateful for motivational interviewing because I do believe it's effective, but what it's brought to me in my life. 
we were able to spend some time down in Chiloquin and meet some wonderful, beautiful people. I've been able to have a partnership and develop a friendship with a brother, Kevin Tomlin, who I've learned tons from. And so I'm just reminded, you know, I'm reminding myself, really, I'm talking to myself about slowing down a little bit and really spending some time in community and then MI or motivational interviewing. And this Stories from the River provides this opportunity for me to do that. And I am eternally grateful for that. Uh, with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to our friend and brother, Kevin Tomlin, to take us through some content here, bro. Thank you, Kevin. I would share that. Um, it's been a privilege just to be able to, uh, I guess, present this idea that gets developed at the at the uh, at the high level. It's a it's a very academic level that MI gets developed at. It's not it's not at the ground level where you're having frontline people develop this it's it was a it was a, a an intellectual with maybe a frontline mentality that gave shape to this style uh, uh basically just being with people that we know as mi motivational interviewing terrible title I don't know if you remember any of this. You're going to hear a lot of repeats, by the way, when we present this content. The content is less important than the connection. And that really is Kevin and I kind of decided to ourselves that that's where we'd like to kick off this community again or just bring this community back around the big picture. You know, one thing Kevin mentioned is um, a value that isn't explicit in the text of motivational interviewing. I have my little textbook right here. In case I get lost and I forget how to be empathic or how to teach how to be empathic, I got my book. I never crack it open, but it's right here. It's my rock. But they don't have in there as a value of gratitude. Uh, Thank you for the opening, Kevin. Every time I hear it, you know, when I hear those push-ups, I hear uh, the spirit, not only of just motivational interviewing, but the spirit of whatever it is that's that's bringing us into your into your community, because it seems like it's something good. It seems like it's something more than um, checking off a box, though it could easily be just that. It's something a little bit more than making sure the funding keeps flowing. It most definitely can do that because it is, and motivational interviewing is one of those, it's got its own acronym. It's warehoused in the warehouse of acronyms of evidence-based practices that, you know, the funders like it. So that's, that is a legitimate thing. And it kind of snuck in there under the radar that there's a spirit to this that really takes me to gratitude in my own work on the front lines and working with human beings who are asking for help from me as a professional sometimes they're not asking for help and i i come and and engage in this way of being compassionate at least trying to be accepting and compassionate and empowering uh the one that's one of the things that we try to teach in those two-day trainings and we'll certainly repeat here that even if you just have the spirit of this, you don't, you're not even sure that you're doing a, a technique 
you know, that you're technically doing an MI thing. But if it's in the spirit of MI, then you're well within the heart of it. And that's where the power is. That's where the effectiveness is. So Kevin and I and AJ, Auntie Kathy, AKA Dr. Tomlin, uh, there was Sean Bear, was out at Grand Ronde with us. Uh, and then many, many people in these events so far where we've just got connection after connection all around, uh, you know, presenting what MI is. Can you go to the next slide, Kevin? See what that says. Yeah, so here we go. A little bit of a reminder of what it is I mean when I'm saying motivational interviewing. We do mean something really specific and that we gathered these groups together to talk about ways of being guiding. ways of, of styling our communication with people in a way that isn't just following them around but it isn't just getting in their face either and telling them what to do not that that's not allowed it's that generally speaking we have a strategy of well i know that i'm being paid as a professional to be a helper yes Lori, we can get you the book Hold that thought, keep asking. Because I know for a fact there's an extra one in my room right here. So at the minimum, I got one for you. <laughs> um, you know, we come around this guiding style designed to empower people based on being respectful in a human way. I mean, does, not, does that not sound familiar, right? How much of this is, well, yeah, this, these are my values. This is who I am. This is my family. This is my community. If I had to describe the values of that, I would maybe say things similar, maybe around more respect. And I might I definitely would talk about ways of being with people that have respect, uh, compassion, an understanding that there's, I'm not going to be selfish. I'm going to try not to be. And that's what this gentleman, Bill Miller, figured out when he was talking to uh, people who were faced with changing their drinking. Um, and he had no training in working with them. He just kind of got thrown in. But he knew he knew how to be a counselor in general. And so he didn't know what the 70s were teaching, which was get in people's face and tear them down, tell them they're selfish. They're full of ego and then build them up again. That was like the strategy of treatment in general. And he didn't know to do that. So what he would do is he would he would engage people in a conversation and um, actually ask them, well, what is it that you want? <laughs> you know, and this is sitting in a, like a treatment center. So it's almost assumed that we're, we know what we're talking about, but he wouldn't make those assumptions. He would just sit down with the person and say, basically, who are you? Without getting in their face, you know, doing it in a skilled way. He was a pastor. He was a professional God person and a PhD type counselor. So he was interweaving this person-centered way of meeting a person where they're at. So they're, they got mixed feelings about their drinking. And he noticed that they would give this debate in the conversation. They'd start out maybe being defensive because of the way the system was. That then when he didn't fight back or try to convince them, say, this is why you should stop. They, he noticed that they would present to him themselves their own reasons for stopping. Same time, they'd have reasons for continuing to drink, reasons for stopping and that he could pick and choose amongst what people said he could just choose out of that what to reflect back to them and whatever gets reflected that's what we put our mind on in the conversation and that's what gets bigger so it's super simple 
the spirit of MI is I'm going to be that respectful person centered professional and I'm going to have this strategy going in the background where if I hear from you um, your own reasons for making a positive change, I'm going to guide in that direction, but not until you bring it up. So the image I, uh, that I like to use is a Sherpa, you know, somebody who's been up and down the mountain a lot, stands there with another person who wants to go up the mountain. There's many ways. And, you know, the way the Sherpa does it is together. You know, keep them out of danger, but we can help them have their own experience. So that center line in this slide is designed to empower people by changing and drawing out their own meaning, importance, and capacity for change. That's really the, the heart of NY. It's about being empowering. Um, in the next slide, there's the, uh, the breakdown of what they're calling the spirit of motivational interviewing. Partnership empowerment, acceptance, and compassion. Again, these are all, these could all easily be the values of a community that um, you may have noticed that we tried to put those values in, in these MI events that we design. They're not so much classes as they are, we try to make them more experiential and in addition to reading off of a slide, also being that way with folks, like trying to work in a partnership way, uh, in a way that draws out somebody else's own priorities. You know, I don't have to walk in with my own agenda. My agenda can be your agenda. And the art of drawing that out making a safe space to be able to practice that often becomes what we do in practicing motivational interviewing. Uh, and that place of acceptance. Um, acceptance really emerges as where the rubber meets the road in terms of actions. Um, dispositions to take, uh, like an attitude to take. And when I have a conversation with somebody, especially um, the idea of being affirming, that has emerged the, um, as one of the real keystones of effective practice of motivational interviewing. Because the idea is in MI is that I, I will... I will engage this way of being with somebody in MI when they they're facing a change or a commitment that they have yet to make. So that means they're on the fence about it. It might be a change they really do want to make, but for whatever reason, they haven't got there yet. Could be that they don't even know that they want to make it. And what what really emerges as powerful is when I can sit there as a as the helping person uh, and accept them 100% uh, as good and the, and not defective. The fact that they don't have that commitment already on board in their heart that it's totally expected and natural to have mixed feelings about whatever it is that uh, they're facing changing in their life, especially if they have to be talking to a professional person or a system of people. That non-judgmental stance, that actual, um, that actual spirit of really wanting to hear what who are you what is your story what is it that brought you here and to do it without judgment you know that so much is the generalized practice 
around the spirit of motivational interviewing. I'm going to check in with Kevin, see where I've talked a little bit. Just see now that you've had a few rounds of going through this with us. Um, what's your take on this, on the spirit of MI? Uh, uh, I, mean, I feel like the spirit of MI truly is. I mean, it's foundational. Um, there's there's a part of me that I, um, you know, there's a story about Bill Miller and those guys really spending time in the Southwest with, I think, some Pueblos and Diné folks. I'm not sure. I, I don't know the specific story. But then out of that, right, out of that time spent there is then, um, you know, MI came on the scene shortly thereafter. So there's a part of me that feels like there's an influence of really some Southwest or some native thought that goes in, you know what I mean? And I feel like the idea around the spirit of MI is um, is truly one of those uh, principles that is universal. I think these principles are universal no matter where you come from. Yeah. Right. And I'm reminded again here because even my own MI practice and my own, you know, it's good to come back into this MI space because I truly do feel like we're, you know, beginning to get back into putting the spirit of MI on, you know, directly. And any time that we have anything, I think, from our communities where we say that it has a spirit, right, then then it's there's life. Oh. Um. And I love this whole concept around, you know, because we're, you know, walking besides people and, and improving their lives. <clears throat> One of the questions that I had come up, and, and because we have a small group, do you mind if we kind of open things up here for a minute? I was totally and, thinking the same thing. Okay is one of the questions that I had, particularly around uh, uh, when I heard you when I was listening is, is what areas in our communities, right, what areas in our jobs have we interacted or experienced now that we have a little grounding of motivational interviewing, do we see where MI would be beneficial in the work that we're doing, mm -hmm. or where it may not be beneficial in the work that we're doing? I'm, I would open up the floor here for anybody to, if, are you raising your hand, Laurie? Go right ahead. Oh, I've already noticed that it's made a huge difference in the fact that in the TANF program, we do an intake when people come in, <clears throat> whether they survive that intake, seriously, some of them don't, they don't like being questioned, they don't like being grouped, they don't, <laughs> You know, they don't like someone coming at them. They've already put their heart down on that paper and what the heck, you know, I don't want to tell you anymore. That's what we got going. And I've noticed that my staff and myself are very kind, a lot kinder. We're very down on the level of someone who is asking for assistance. I, that just sounds bad, but I'm not trying to make it sound bad, but we're, we're, we're trying to be more, um, open and willing and trying to show that we we're not up here and you're down here mm -hmm. we know what it took for you to come in here it took a lot because i think people are scraping the bottom long before they make it to our program they they've been trying to figure it out on their own and it just hasn't been working so i have to say it has made a huge difference in my style appreciate that laurie and that you highlight uh super important point especially around just the reason that you know bill miller and the people who are like committed to bringing him I, one of the main reasons they want to bring this out past the college level past the academy past research and into practice is that it doesn't have to be just psychiatry <laughs> or like doctors and patients in fact it it's showing to be even more useful at that level of intake where there's that first contact with people because that's where the ambivalence is like, that's where they're meeting a system. They're meeting a piece of paper with like fields they got to fill in and then they got to repeat it with somebody. The way that that one person is has emerged as making a huge difference in outcomes when a person has to go 
quote unquote, through a system. That is exactly the spirit of MI. There's power in that. Just being able to walk somebody, help somebody literally, literally survive the conversation, right? That's a really good example of like somebody because, you know, if they're, they filled out this form and then you got to take them through the form and yeah, it's personal. I'd get defensive. And maybe it's so it's people have been through whatever they've been through it and they, they've had it and they're like, you know, what, screw this. Like, oh, that's what I heard you say. They, they might not survive the conversation. And th there you go. If there's no connection, there's no services. So this is exact. That's a really good example of what we're talking about, that this is applicable from the get go. Just even listening or reviewing a sheet with somebody. There's a way of doing that. And I love how you said kindness. All right? Maybe that's the word to encapsulate this. Kindness. Thank you, Larry. I, I wanted to present the question again. Welcome, Tiny. Um, we wanted to present the question again, and if anybody want to share, it's like, since this MI training or, or since we've come to do this, are there any areas in your job and your community where you feel like MI has really improved or MI is applicable or, or it makes sense to use, or maybe it's beneficial or not beneficial to use? Um, and we're kind of having a discussion around around that particular question right there. I would open up the floor again if anybody has anything prompted to discuss. <clears throat> One of the things that I thought about when when Lori was talking, and thank you again, Lori, for sharing, is you know I work in in child welfare, and um, more so recently, you know, we've I felt like I've seen an uptick in the work that I've been doing that's uh it's just required and it's been so draining and as a part of that work you know i i catch myself you know really trying to close down a bit and becoming a bit callous right because there has to be a you know I, as a professional there needs you know i'm developing a practice of of like making sure that i can continue to work and some of this stuff is really heavy work and then listening to what Lori, you know, shared, it was a reminder for me. And then coming through to the spirit of MI, is to remember that that <clears throat> we putting on the spirit of MI. And we had this great discussion in the summer here in Grand Ronde about how when we're working in partnership and we're working in compassion, um, that the practice of MI allows us um, to to engage a client, but also separate out from ourselves separate out the needs that the client has from us and i'm not sure if i'm articulating this point well enough and i want to do that but a lot of times in the work as practitioners we have a tendency to you know because we're helpers we want to take things on right and we had this great discussion and sean bear i can't articulate it really talked about how when we're in compassion we understand and recognize that people bring their own you know People bring their own answers, but they're bringing their own stuff as well, too. But when they have that answers, I'm not responsible for fixing anybody. They're doing it themselves. We're just walking beside them. Um, that's a clear distinction for me, right? And it's important. It's a reminder for me as well, too, about, you know, why we're doing this. We're particularly around stories from the rivers because, you know, uh, it's good to be in community around AMI. It's good to to refresh our skills, to refresh our heart, to refresh our spirit around motivational interviewing practices and to hear how other people are working. Thank you for that example, Lori. Um, I appreciate it. Is there anybody else that's feeling prompted to share? I would like to share something. Yes. I see because I don't work with clients, but I see 
the benefits of having had the MI training among staff, um, where staff is more open with each other, kinder to one another, more compassionate with each other. And it's, it's starting to build a rapport among our staff. So I think it's been very, very, very beneficial for us to have gone through the training. Just a good point. I, uh, I had noticed immediately when I came into the community of the trainers of MI, there's a whole global community of motivational interviewing trainers and there's an initiation process basically of getting in. You gotta show that you know how to do it you, that you at least don't suck and get record yourself. And then you end up rubbing shoulders with a lot of different people who know MI inside and out. And what I observed was that there were some who would, they put it on and take it off like it was a hat. And you can do that. One can do that. <laughs> One can be like, okay, compassion. And then they'll take it off. And then I found some would be like just interacting, you know, behind the scenes, as it were, with me. They're like, this is an MI, you know? And I kind of took it on like the spiritual side of me because I'm into spirituality, walking paths. I love that stuff. And this reminds me a lot of that. And then MI is very careful to say, well, it's not that. We're not teaching, you know, a paradigm. As my buddy likes to say, it's not a paradigm. You know, well, it is a way of being and you can turn it on and turn it off. Man, is it easier if I have it on. And even when I'm behind the scenes and kind of especially <laughs> depending on what context I'm in. I mean, if I'm around people who have mixed feelings about being there, then they qualify for MI too. It's not limited just to like the, the, the playing field, to game time. It's a human thing. And this is where we started recognizing, oh, this is something like at a tribal level, what conversation can come out of that? That this is just a human thing. So that's really encouraging to hear, Daylene, that that uh, that to me is the secret ingredient of MI is that it makes it makes my professional life easier. It makes it easier for me with my clients, way more so with the people I work with. I think it's just because I'm I'm opening up to them a little bit more, and and vice versa. It's contagious. It's a really good point. And I feel like it's a fine example of, of, you know, it's a good example of kind of the, the, you know, the, the foundation of, of what we're doing here today, you know, we're talking about the power of connection, right? That when we're in the spirit of MI, when we're in this place, right? It helps us to be more capable of connecting with one another, no matter how tired we are, or no matter who we're working with. Lori, I love the idea of the, the power dynamic that you mentioned, you know, the client versus, you know, the intake. Right? When we're in the spirit of MI, it, it, it reduces some of those power dynamics, some of those areas and, and barriers that allow us to, to really develop connection because the people that we serve uh, are deserving of that, but also are needing connection. I feel like that's foundational for our world. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so with that, I, you know, I, I am reminded about just how important it is to continue this. Um, when we talk about putting on, you know, it's, you know, I felt a little convicted there, Kevin, when you were talking about <laughs> putting on it. <laughs> That's true. 
You can't and it is it true, him. but that is true, right? That feeling of, you know, being is that, you know, I, I go in throughout my day, I'm putting on and, and taking off. And I, the question that I ask myself is like, <clears throat> how do I embed these, these principles, these practices in my daily life? Uh-huh. And one of the things that I thought is like, well, I, you know, probably need to attend to it more and be in a community where these values and principles, right? Are not only valued but and and important, but where they're mobilized. That's why I love this idea of stories from the river. This, I was enthusiastic to try it out because mm-hmm. that's really the idea. That's what they found over decades of practicing trying to teach this to folks. Is that it's great to have those events, those two day long trainings, and you know most people are. They recognize it. It's not like there's <laughs> there's a lot of controversy and, and disagreement most of the time. People don't disagree. This is great. Uh, and it's just amazing how it doesn't translate into the work. The research has shown that two-day training is, it just gives you the idea of what it is. And that the real way to get it on board is to develop community is you know to have people that have a, a similar interest come together and even in an informal way like this just to be talking about the spirit of mi brings it back up and then we get that reminder oh i can actually take this into my work today i can do this today because it's human yes there are techniques and there can, there's all kinds of practice and ways of getting much better at the technique side of it and what makes the connection happen? The spirit, the thing that we do, we do know how to do that. So there is that decision that can make to put it on. So I don't have to walk into my job, you know, well, I might need to walk into my job with boundaries, but, and that there's a there's an informed boundary there, that maybe there are opportunities to show some compassion I love what what Angie put in the chat. Um, I can read it, Angie, or if you want to share it, 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 it. But if you, I can share. Okay. Um, I um, suffer from adult ADD, so sometimes I have to write things down so I don't forget. So I put it in the chat there. Oh. And I think. Um, I don't have a whole lot of experience and training um, with MI a little bit. And the little bit that I had was like a four day um, besides what we had last year beyond that at the state level, a four day, six to eight hour day of training Mm. each day. Um, And it was uh, presented by uh, from a different perspective perspective, non-Indigenous perspective, and still held so much value in the sense that it really becomes, like I said, like an art form, but it's individualized to each person. We're all going to present MI in a different way. We're all going to have our own techniques, methods, verbiage, you know, our own narrative. And, and the beautiful thing that I learned about it, and when I was actively using it in my role at work, and then also that bled into my home life with my teenage daughter, wow. <laughs> is self-realization is like the most valuable method or tool to help people get to the next place, whatever that might be for them. I could tell them all day long, my thoughts and feelings and interject, you know, that I think they should try this, or I think, do you think that this is where you're going with this, but utilizing MI as a way for them to tell me, right? what they're discovering and what I probably as a provider or a clinician already can see, but maybe they can't, right? They have buy-in then. It's not me telling them something. It's them having that aha moment to go, oh, 
I feel this way. I think this way. I need to do this next for myself. Um, and when I learned how to use that, it really shifted the work that I was doing and also the outcome. The outcome was either quicker or um, it stuck. It didn't take as long, uh, more successful in the long run over periods of time. Um, and so I think that that is really something that we need in our community is to allow people the space and to just help them along in coming into their own thoughts and feelings without somebody telling them what that might be. Mm -hmm. Or guides, guiding people through realizing who they are. Great way to put it. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. So our thought with these, these, um, I don't know what, what to call these. Episode sounds a little diagnostic. It's not an episode. These <laughs> sessions, yeah. you know, every couple of weeks, get together and talk. Am I? Yeah. So we we thought that it would be, you know, one thing we say in the addiction treatment world, and you know, it's kind of getting out into the culture, into the big C culture, is that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety or the steps or something. At least it is for many. But we'll say the opposite of addiction is connection. And that gives people a window, right? That if you hear any story of overcoming that particular kind of problem, you're going to hear a story of isolation coming into connection in some way, shape, or form with something, someone, you know, that, it, that has meaning, depth, and weight. And that that's what we, and I mean, is that not community? That MI is a means of connecting in an effective way, a safe way. One thing that uh, Auntie Kathy, Dr. Tomlin, will say often, I haven't heard her say it around here yet, but that especially when you get into talking about, well, what about filling out forms and I got to do this two hour long intake? She says MI is the fastest way. It is the fastest way to get to an outcome. Man, it, does it not look like that, though? Because you might even put the clipboard down <laughs> and just sit there and have a conversation about, okay, what's really going on here? You know, it's the fastest way. Acknowledge who is this person and what are they going through in this very moment? You know, if we can get to that point, then there's possibility to connect. And there's a lot of power in that. So that's our hope moving forward in these is, you know, build some ground swell um, and get this into, hopefully it becomes a dialogue, a conversation. So it's not so much just like a, a class, like a drill down. We could certainly do stuff like that. And it seems, it just seems way more meaningful to talk about the spirit of it and what really drives this. And that prompts the, you know, prompts the question for me. I know that I'm working to build my own MI practice now. Um, where are those resources, right? Where are those places that I can go to increase my confidence? First and foremost, I think just the oars, right? I feel like comfortable enough now that I can sit with folks and be in partnership and empowerment, acceptance and compassion, but then to mobilize the actual practice of motivational interviewing mm -hmm. with the oars is where I begin to feel like I, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> so there doesn't need to be an answer to it other than to say that, you know, looking for places that we can begin to to develop and practice some more and i think that comes with the coaching and the consulting i think that's a great place to 
start in addition to coming to something like this? Absolutely. Just write down those ores. I will never forget my first interview ever to get into a, a as a counselor in addiction treatment. They asked, I crammed in the parking lot beforehand. MI stuff. Just it's like I heard MI, they do MI here a lot. So they asked me, what are the ores? <laughs> and I said, uh, and I went through them open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And the lady stopped and said, you're the first one out of this whole pool of applicants to get that 100% correct. It's like, yes. And that tells you something, right? It isn't practiced out there. Like, we all know this. And to practice it in a structured way like that, that's a great way where you can just start thinking am I? Like maybe even after the fact, like make four columns and go, generally speaking, how'd I do on these? And just thinking in terms of those four things, hmm. um, uh, it gets you thinking in terms of MI. That's a great uh, coaching move there, Kevin. It is a confidence builder because that is, that's how you know, am I practicing MI here? If you're keeping track of ORs, you are practicing MI. And you don't need somebody to observe you. You know what you did, you know, observation and all that stuff can come later. But right now, maybe even just to think back and reflect through that lens, that's a great way to practice MI. Any conversation, I used to practice on grandma all the time. I'd tell her even. She's great because she loved to talk. So I could just like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I count that open-ended question. <laughs> That's a great idea, Kevin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tomlin. I do, we do want to be respectful of po people's time and lunch hour at 1258. I would like to present this opportunity here. Um, if there are any, um, if there's anybody that, that wants to add something here quickly, um, the floor is open. Tiny. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Tiny. <laughs> I wanted to apologize for coming in late today. I got caught up with uh, somebody and I was actually MI in them um, because mm. we were going through some trauma today. Um, I just wanted to chime in and I appreciated everybody's feedback. I, I really appreciated it. Um, when we're going through it with somebody, it also takes a toll on ourselves too. Um, for me, you know, coming from a family of many, many generations of trauma and trying to uh, go through it with a young one kind of brings you back down those old rivers um, when you're in the moment with those people and they're em and you're empathizing with them. But um, I just wanted to uh, uh, mention that one of the things that I try to remember is um, in trauma care, I reflect on the things that were taken from our ancestors and those that raised us over the generations. And that was the, the freedom to make choices and have options in what was said or done in our lives when they were stripped away, you know, from the boarding schools and things like that, that my parents went to. Um, which strips us of our integrity. So when we're allowing them to start the journey down the river with us, uh, using them oars, um, being able to navigate the different waters, sometimes they're rough and rugged and rafty, and sometimes they're calm, but there's dangers underneath we don't see. Uh, they can rear their head at any time. So just uh, remembering that that journey down the river uh, for myself, it's gonna draw up some of them things from the past, but there's, there's that part where um, I can instill empathy in the individual. I, I envision what they're going through and affirming, making sure that I affirm the actions that they've been taken. That's uh, gonna build respect and trust just by listening and staying in the in the now 
try to get out of my own head, not be thinking about what I'm going to respond, uh, but actually sitting there in their story, going down that water, and uh, being able to uh, pay attention and reflect that back so they can let me know if I heard them correctly. Um, if I misunderstood them, that's not what I said, that's not what I meant. Um, being humble enough to ask them to explain it to me because I didn't get it right. Um, you know, and then um, at the end, you know, giving them that informed consent about, you know, like uh, somebody said earlier, it's a system. We sit in paid positions for a reason, but we're all helpers, whether or not we're in an office or we're in our house. Uh, it's a way of life and people with trauma need to motivate one another all the time. And uh, even today, I have a really tough case and it's a young one and it's been a long journey over the last year, but um, man, leaps and bounds for this young tribal member. And uh, we got a ways to go down the river and uh, it's good to see the journey but it's kind of struggling at the same time. It's making sure that I think Angie said uh, self-reflection. It always begins with us. How are we feeling? Uh, how is this story affecting me? What is it triggering? Do I have counter transference, which means something, something from that person is reminding me whether I know it or not of something in my past and it could trigger me to respond to them in a negative manner and again having that humility to say you know ask them if they want to keep working with me or is it too much uh do, would they like to try to work with someone else that's that humbleness that i've learned to take and there's been a couple times down the road you know where things didn't pan out with me and a, another person and i was humble enough to ask for them to work with someone else so that's all uh, motivational uh, communications, I call it, um, in tribal communities of trauma. So uh, that's just all I have. Thank you. And I, again, apologize for coming in late. Oh, thanks, Tiny. Thank you very much, Tiny. I am reminded about the broadness of, of this approach here and how there is room for you know, for for people to to truly learn it and then make it their own, and that there is power in connection, but there is power in using motivational interviewing with outcomes. You know, with the clients that we serve. Uh, thank you for carrying that flag. I I want to be cognizant of people's time. We are over by a few minutes here. Uh, we will meet again on March 2nd. We'll open up the room on March 2nd. Uh, we're working on the content in terms of, I think we may lead into some oars. Um, we appreciate everyone being here. It's good to be in community with everyone. Um, we look forward to, to seeing you all in two weeks. If you have any questions, uh, let us, you know, Feel free to message us. We'll get our, our emails out there. And Lori, we'll get you a copy of that book um, quickly. And um, we'll see everyone uh, in two weeks. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll talk to you later. Sounds good.